started here. Um, so I just um, I just wanted to uh, uh, welcome you all to uh, our lectures and planning series, and thank you all for being patient with the room changes. Um, but I'm uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Michael Batty today. Uh, Michael Batty is a is the Bartlett Professor of Planning at University College London, where he is chair of the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, uh, CASA. He has worked on computer models of cities and their visualization since the 1970s, and has published several books, uh, such as Cities and Complexity and The New Science of Cities. Um, his most recent book, Inventing Future Cities, was published by MIT Press in late 2018. He blogs at uh, complexcity.info. Uh, and it covers the science underpinning the technology of cities, and his posts and lectures on big data and smart cities are at spatialcomplexity.info. Uh, so prior to this current position, he was professor of city planning and dean of the School of Environmental Design at the University of Wales at Cardiff from 1979 to 1990, and the director of the National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis at the State University of New York at Buffalo from 1990 to 1995. Um, in 2015, he received the gold medal of the Royal Geographical Society for his work on the science of cities. In 2016, he received the Senior Scholar Award of the Complex Systems Society and the gold medal of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Um, in 2018, he was awarded the Walter Tobler Prize for GI Science uh, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and in 2019, he was elected as a fellow of the Regional Science Association. Uh, for, but perhaps all this is not yet captured, um, the depth and, um, of his founding and continued uh, impact on the field of um, urban analysis. Um, so I just want to again welcome <laughs> Michael Batty to, to Columbia GSAP. Um, and with that, I'll hand it to, to you, Professor Daddy. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Wen Fry. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Like New York City, it's a great, diverse, complicated kind of place, something new every time. Um, okay, uh, Wen Fry said that um, my two recent books, um, Inventing Future Cities and The New Science Cities, both published by MIT Press, I'm very proud of the fact that both of them have been translated into Chinese. Um, and I've only seen one of them, basically, so I don't know how many people in China have seen them, but they're in Chinese, right? So there's a lot of Chinese in the audience here. I presume you still speak Chinese, even if you're not Chinese. You know? So um, uh, anyway, um, uh, if you search on the web, you can find it. OK, now I'm going to talk about digital twins. Um, in some senses, this is a, a, a concept that's been around a long time, but it's become very popular recently uh, in terms of all kinds of things, all kinds of digital models being built of real systems, not just in cities, but in, in lots of areas, in organizations and so on, and right throughout the sciences. So uh, I'm really going to talk about the idea of digital twins. I mean, to cut a long story short, uh, digital twins are really digital models. They're computer models. To some extent, we've been... Uh, we've been doing this uh, yeah, almost since computers were invented. Um, computers were invented, in fact, about 80 years ago, uh, just before and uh, during the Second World War, for very obvious reasons. Um, and almost immediately, uh, computers came on the scene in science labs, etc. They began to be applied to real problems. So, for example, uh, in city planning, if you go back to the mid-1950s, the Chicago Area Transportation Study Commission developed a whole series of different computer models, very different, of course, from uh, uh, the way we do things today. Uh, Wassily Leontief at Harvard, basically, who developed the input-output model when he was still in Russia uh, in the 1920s, made it operational um, uh, using analog uh, technology at MIT, Harvard MIT, and, and that was really during the, um, uh, just before the war years. And, of course, input-output modeling is pretty... Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty widespread within uh, re urban and regional economics in that context. So again, an example of an early model. A digital twin, if you like, although we didn't call them in those days. So I've actually put this um, uh, PDF of this talk on my website. Uh, so um, if you go to spatial complex, just go to spatialcomplexity.info. That's, uh, uh, that's the link that uh, came up when I just shoved it on recently. But spatialcomplexity.info. Um, 
uh, and uh, digital twins and you actually find the um, uh, find the PDF and I'll tweet it uh, uh, a little bit later so anybody following my tweet uh, and there's my uh, handler basically at J Michael Batty you find uh, uh, you'll, find, you'll be able to download it directly. Okay, so let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm really going to talk about and, and, and give you my idea of what the smart city is, because to some extent, uh, most of what we're doing at the moment in terms of making things digital is loosely uh, badged under this notion of the smart city. Now, uh, in some sense, I'm going to make the distinction between what we call the high-frequency city and what we call the low-frequency city. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the high-frequency city is most of what we think about in terms of smart cities today. They're, they're basically what's happening over uh, seconds, minutes, hours, etc. What's happening during the typical day. Whereas the low-frequency city is to some extent, uh, if you go back um, 10 or 20 years, then most of what we did in cities was looking at them over much longer periods of time. So, for example, master planning and urban design and so on is really the low frequency city. Time is not of the essence in some sense. You could argue that uh, although planning is about the future, in a sense, uh, previous planning is really, um, in some sense, uh, timeless in some sense. Uh, in that sense, it's, it's mainly about space. So the low frequency city um, is something that we need to contrast with the high frequency city. And basically, uh, the high frequency city is something that's emerged really with a vengeance over at the last 10 or 15 years. And that's largely because uh, of what we see around us here. Um, uh, I've got a laptop, etc. There's um, I, I'm linked into this thing showing you the PowerPoint. Um, uh, somebody's on an iPad over there. Uh, there's quite a few Macs, you can tell because of the uh, because of the Apple logo sort of shining out. I can see that in the audience. People have probably got the uh, parallel posting on their phones and so on. So in some sense, this is really the high-frequency city. This is what's being embedded uh, into the environment all around, it, around us. And it's not going to get less. It's not stable. It's going to be massive. It is massive uh, in some senses. That uh, I think the number of smartphones worldwide is something of the order of about two uh, to three billion. Well, of course, there's only seven billion people, uh, seven to eight billion people actually on the planet, basically. So we're talking about 20, 30, 40 percent of people, everywhere that is, who have smartphones, and therefore they probably have access to, uh, to the net in that context, access to a great load of information. That's the high-frequency city in that sense. And the, the idea of big data, uh, the, many of the, uh, the talks in, in this series deal with the high frequency city, but big data in particular um, is the kind of data that really streams out of the sensors, it streams out of our phones, streams out of the embedded sensors. Um, if you go to London, one of my examples later on will be uh, the embedded sensors on the transit system on the London Tube, basically, uh, which is almost entirely digital now, both in terms of when trains arrive and when passengers kind of tap in and tap out and get on trains in that sense. Um, and that, one of my examples of the dig digital twin will be exactly that kind of data on the high frequency uh, city, the transit system, and how that relates. Okay. Um, I'll begin to also say where do digital twins come from. To some extent, I anticipated that because, uh, but in a way, uh, we're thinking a lot about it at the present time in that sense. Uh, and then I'm going to actually look at, at a slight digression, a cornucopia of twins, if you like, maps as analogies. I want to actually make, uh, develop the idea uh, that models are close to the real thing. Digital twins, in some sense, are closer and closer to the real thing. They can never be the real thing, basically. But there are lots of examples, in some sense, in, um, uh, in thinking about uh, twins in that context through the idea of maps. And I'm going to actually look back historically at what people have said about maps. And that's a slight digression, uh, but it, 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 it illustrates this idea of uh, digital twins. Now, in some senses, um, the digital twin idea can also be seen as hardware turning into software in that sense. And what's actually happening is that um, uh, much of the software that's being invented layer upon layer is actually penetrating the urban fabric in some sense. And building information models are a good example. Um, building information models are now writ large in terms of designing buildings. Uh, many of those models are actually entering the building fabric itself that you can't really run the building, a complicated building, without actually using the same software to actually maintain it and to uh, run its functions and so on as were actually used for its design in that sense. 
Okay, and then I'm going to look at three very different types of twins, three very different types of examples. And I'll probably spend about, uh, um, possibly about half the lecture on this. So the first half will be, uh, in, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, will really be all of that, what you see on the screen. And then I'm going to spend um, uh, about 20 minutes talking about particular examples, three different types of twins. Uh, the first sort of, of twin, which is quite close to the real thing superficially, to the city is virtual reality and augmented reality, 3D city models and building information models. I'm just going to talk about an example in East London um, uh, uh, of uh, how buildings are being wired in some sense to talk about the idea that these digital models of buildings are quite close to the building itself. They're part and parcel of it. Uh, my second example will be the, uh, the automation of the London transit system. Uh, and if you're familiar with uh, many of the new transit systems, for example, in, in large Chinese cities, for example, Shanghai, uh, 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 Guangzhou and so on, and Beijing, uh, then um, uh, this applies as much to them as it does to the London Tube. It doesn't quite apply to the New York subway system. One still has to get almost a physical card in some sense. You can't use... Um, you know, Apple Pay or anything like that, whereas you can on the London subway. And in some senses, of course, this will come, basically. It's, it's not going to be very long before those systems get automated. Once we get that kind of automation, uh, then we're beginning to think about controlling those systems. And that's where the digital twin again comes into its own. The last example is really the, high, the uh, low frequency city, long term urban change. And I'm going to tell you about a model that we're building for. Uh, not for London, but for uh, Great Britain. Great Britain is the island of, um, uh, is the main island. It's uh, uh, basically England, Wales, and Scotland. Uh, not Northern Ireland, because that's separated. So this is, we're building a scaling, uh, a land use transportation model called Quant to the whole thing. And that really is designed to do traditional things in terms of uh, uh, the low frequency city, looking at long term change, infrastructure planning, and so on. But it's another example uh, of a digital twin. Um, and to some extent, the kind of uh, takeaway message in all of this is is this concept useful for actually thinking about our modeling of the cities? Is it useful in some sense? And to some extent, I would submit it is, largely because it enables us to actually think a little bit out of the box about these things, in a sense. Okay. First of all, then, what is, what, is the, uh, what is the smart city? Well, to some extent, I've, I've really anticipated everything on this slide. Uh, we make this distinction between the high-frequency city. Uh, if you like, you can think of it as the 24-hour city uh, or, or the city over a relatively short period of time. That's become particularly popular, the idea of uh, finding out what's happening over 24-hour cycles in some sense. And it's in contrast to the low-frequency city, which most of our urban theory is all about. If you look at urban economics and if you look at urban geography, uh, if you look at urban sociology, it's really about how segregation takes place over long periods of time, um, how uh, uh, markets get established and so on. It's not really uh, about the what's happening in the next 10 seconds or the next 10 minutes or the next 10 hours in some sense, in that sense, it's over much longer periods of time. So that's the distinction. Now, of course, digital twins apply to both, and to some extent, smart city technologies, uh, which are essentially digital, also apply to most, but, but most of them apply to the high-frequency city rather than the low-frequency, and that will become, uh, become apparent. Okay, so let me actually define the smart city from a simple diagram. I've used this uh, quite a lot before, but it actually helps to focus ideas. Uh, on this diagram, the, uh, the top left-hand box, which is uh, um, a sort of, um, well, they're both orange, aren't they, these colours, that uh, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, the real built and social environment um, is sort of yellowish box, basically, and that represents the city. It's what's out there, basically, uh, in some sense. It's what we're studying. Uh, it's what you're studying in some sense. It's, it's separate from you. You're separate from it in a sense. And we develop theories related to that, uh, uh, that built and social environment. And these theories, in fact, are in this, uh, in this second box, uh, which is the orange box, basically, our theories of the city. And to some extent, there is a circularity between them. We draw data uh, about the real built environment. In other words, we observe it. Um, whether you want to call it data or not, but nevertheless we get some sense of what's going on uh, in the real built environment, and that conditions uh, through induction normally, uh, or inference, etc., our theories about the city, 
our hypotheses about how it works, uh, and then we test those against the real city in some sense. That's almost like the scientific method uh, in some sense, where we draw data from the real city, we produce our theories and so on, uh, and then we test them. And there's nothing in what I've just said uh, that necessarily means it's got to do with computers or, or digital in this particular context. So in fact, over the last 50, 60, 70 years, people have begun to use computers to actually help us build models of these theories and then to test them uh, against the real built and social environment to improve them in this particular context. So you can think of this as really being kind of quasi-scientific method in some sense. We may enter the method at any particular point. Uh, if we're people who are interested in data, we may actually be much more interested in, uh, in, in this hour really than and if we're interested in models, we might be interested in that. But to some extent, to get completeness on this, we have to be interested in both. Now, what's happened in the last 20 years, and maybe just the last 10 years, many people say that the new reality of the smart city really dates from 2007, which is when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. That's when we all became empowered. Uh, in a sense, to be to, to be able to access the net. It's more complicated than that, but generally speaking, what's happened in the last 20 years, say, uh, since the millennium, since the year 2000, uh, is that into this picture have come computers and sensors for the first time. So the real built environment um, is now being sensed, and uh, people involved in these information technologies are basically building sensors everywhere. And, of course, the biggest sensor of all, in fact, is the iPhone in this particular context, because the iPhone, it said, is picking up information all the time, just about everything, in a sense. And I'm not talking about Google or Apple actually tracking you in the iPhone. They do that, of course. Uh, I'm talking about the kind of information that you're generating uh, when you use these devices to do a multitude of things. So that's new, basically. And out of that particular context... Uh, in the last 10 or 15 years has actually come real-time stream data, uh, big data. And all the fuss about big data is due to the fact that we're embedding computers and sensors into everything around us. Now, this has been going on a long time. It's been going on for probably 50 or 60 years, but it, it's only really become possible to do this on any large scale since computers have been miniaturized down, they've scaled down to the point where we can actually embed them uh, indeed in the environment without worrying too much about them. They're getting smaller all the time and they say that the next great wave of embedding is going to be embedding these things into ourselves and that's pretty scary basically <coughs> etc. There's lots of ethical implications about that but modern medicine is very much um, geared to the notion of, uh, well modern society geared to the notion of um, taking these uh, uh, the, these embeddings, basically, and using them to actually improve, in our context, to improve cities, but in medicine to improve uh, 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 our possible functioning in that sense. Okay, so real-time stream data. Um, one of the features, as this diagram shows, is that real-time stream data is not the reason why computers and sensors have been put into cities. Um, the reason why they're put into cities is if you look, say, at the London Tube, my example, the reason why you tap in and tap out, how you do it on your phone and this sort of thing, use a credit card, etc., on the phone, uh, the reason why you do that is for payment purposes. It's not so we can analyze the transportation system, etc. So, to some extent, the real time stream data that comes out of this is a byproduct. It's often what people call information exhaust. It may be useful to us, but on the other hand, it may not be useful at all. I'll show you an example of um, real-time stream data where uh, there's a good deal of noise in the data so that it actually confounds it. It's not as good as traditional sorts of data uh, which are much more expensive to collect and so on, which have much more structure. So real-time stream data. The second issue in this is that if you've looked at, if anybody talked to you about big data, they'll talk about the three Vs, volume, uh, veracity, um, variety and so on, in fact there are more than three Vs, but the really big V in terms of big data is volume. The reason why it's big is largely because um, it's streamed incessantly uh, at the same sort of rate at which the sensor picks up uh, data in some sense, so only when you switch the sensor off 
uh, does it no longer stream? And indeed, even in the context of phones, your phone may be off, but it still might be uh, streaming uh, data to uh, some particular archive somewhere. So to some extent, big data is very much associated with this notion of embedding computers into the environment. Okay, uh, a couple of things on this. Uh, the reason why computers and sensors are being embedded in that sense is for information and control, for payment purposes and so on. Uh, and what comes out of it, the big data, is information, uh, information exhaust. Now let me actually uh, throw onto this canvas uh, a number of other things that are, are relevant in some sense. Uh, low frequency models is mainly what we've been doing here. So in other words, if we look at the city and work out there are certain problems of segregation and so on, and we want to actually rearrange land uses to minimize that in some sense. This is really the notion of a low frequency model. It takes time for us to actually implement a master plan, because we know by the time we get to that point it will change in that sense. But nevertheless, um, the low frequency activity um, is, is largely what we've done in the past. What's actually entered big time into this context is high frequency models in some sense. Now, high frequency models have always been there. And this is an excellent test bed here in New York because uh, really for 50 years, the police department, um, transportation and so on have used high frequency models in some sense, often non-digital, um, uh, highly manualized in a sense, uh, uh, throwing people at the problem rather than computers. High frequency uh, models have been used for emergency services, for police, fire, and so on, in that sense. There's a long history here in New York of this, which relates back to the uh, RAND Corporation, Research and National Development Corporation, with their New York City project in the late, uh, uh, the late 1960s, the early 1970s, when New York was having uh, all of those awful uh, problems of uh, increased crime and, and housing problems and so on. Uh, okay, so in some sense, the high frequency models have always been there, but of course, with all of this new data, uh, we're getting much better, in some sense, in quotes, uh, high frequency models than we've ever had before. Now, broadly speaking, uh, models in this particular context um, are referred to, really, in some sense, as urban analytics. Um, none of these terms are cast in tablets of stone. Um, all of these words are... Uh, contingent on who is using them in some senses. So the semantics of it are, uh, like all semantics in this context, a little bit vague in that sense of urban analytics is planning tools, planning techniques, if you like, a whole range of different things. But to some extent, it's a term which is now being used in relation to this notion of the smart city. Um, and all of this, of course, is pertaining to big data. So that diagram sort of shows you all the kind of bits, basically, uh, that give a kind of potted summary of the idea of the smart city. Um, and what we're going to do now is to talk about how digital twins uh, fit into this. Okay, now let me turn to this idea of digital twins. Um, uh, in some sense, in an audience like this, you'd say that, you, you, you'd probably be able to say that a digital twin is a model in some sense. And models are simplifications or abstractions of the real thing. When we build a model, we actually throw most of what were, uh, what might appear to go in the model away, and we actually keep uh, the kind of kernel of what we consider we can actually articulate in terms of theory uh, within the model. So often it's said that the best models are the simplest, the best theories are the simplest, much depends on purpose. And so we can have lots of different models of the same thing. Uh, indeed, you can say that everybody... Uh, approaching the same problem would have a different model of the problem in that context and there's nothing wrong in that that's simply the variety of of life in that sense so the model can never really be a twin because a twin uh, in that sense sounds far too close to the real thing in a some sense so in other words as we're simplifying and um, abstracting in terms of models they're bound to actually not be the same as the real thing. The whole purpose about the model is that it isn't the real thing. It, it extracts the essence of the real thing that we're interested in. So if we're interested in transportation problems, in some sense, we actually keep in the background a whole range of other problems that may or may not uh, link to them. A good model would uh, be able to put them on one side and be able to inform on the uh, the problem uh, in focus, etc., without worrying too much about other problems. So to some extent, uh, the model can never be uh, the same, uh, the same as the real thing. But in the move from the high, from the low frequency city, where models are clearly 
uh, not the real thing. They're, they're a long, long way away from it. Uh, and it's the difference between the real thing and the map in some sense. And the movement from the low frequency city to the high frequency city it does appear as though our models are coming a little bit closer to the real thing. Now, if you're a kind of uh, a purist in that sense, it, the digital twin can never be the real thing. Uh, because if the digital twin were the real thing, it would be the real thing, basically, uh, in this particular context. So the talk really is about how close can the model get to the original system, to the real system, um, in this particular context. So we're saying here, a digital twin cannot be a mirror image. It can't be the same as the original. And in this context, uh, we assume it's a simulation. But I'm putting a lot of question marks about this, because to some extent, the more we think about it, the more we're beginning to pick up ideas of where um, the digital model, etc., is entering, in some sense, the, or embedding itself. Uh, into the uh, thing that's being modelled in a sense. Now, first of all, models depend on their media, and the media in this particular context is digital. So if the original real thing is digital, we might actually build a digital model of, what is, of something which is digital. Now, of course, if you look at production processes, automation basically, that a vast array of our production processes and manufactured processes are digital now in some sense. They're never completely digital because we're producing material products in that sense. But in that particular context, the digital model is getting closer uh, in terms of those artifacts to the uh, where those artifacts are being manufactured. CAD CAM, for example, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, uh, is really all about that in a sense. Now, the second issue here is that the digital twin can't really be the digital twin can't really be used for predicting a future, and that's because models uh, may be I'm sorry a digital twin can be used for predicting the future, uh, whereas um, in, uh, a future that does not exist. Let me go back and say that again. A digital model. Um, we're asking the question, can a digital model, a digital twin, be used for predicting a future that does not exist, in some sense? Now, models can be used for predicting that futures that don't exist. But in some sense, the digital model, uh, the digital twin, would no longer be a twin in some sense, because most of the systems to which it's applied, um, and I'll show you these examples in a moment, uh, are really not those that predict the future. Uh, the digital twin might be used to control the process in some sense, but not necessarily to predict the future. So models differ from digital twins in some sense, uh, largely because uh, the digital twin can't really be used for predicting the future. It, it, in, it, in terms of the definition uh, relative to the real thing, twinning the real thing, then of course the real thing is not predicting the future, it's predicting, predicting the function. Okay, third feature is the digital twin is reactive rather than predictive. If it's predictive, how close is the prediction to the real thing? Uh, and there is a degree of latency, a degree of mismatch between uh, a digital process operating in real time and um, uh, a digital model of that particular process. For the model to be useful, um, it can't be the same as the real thing, otherwise it would be the real thing. It has to, in some sense, be different from it. Uh, and if it's operating in real time, the real time in the digital twin must be a little bit different, uh, a little bit behind, if you like, uh, be, uh, than the, uh, the digital model itself. Now, sometimes digital twins transfer information between the uh, real process uh, and the model. And in fact, most of the models that we're involved in, uh, in this particular context, don't really transfer information. Some of the things we'll look at are getting close to that, but most of our models in the past are the low frequency city, and certainly the ones we have now for the high frequency city, don't transfer information in that context. There's still the notion of abstracting from the real thing. Now, the last point here on this slide is that um, the digital twin uh, might be a kind of controller to some extent. It might be a mechanism which is actually embedded in the system itself. So we can think of the twin as containing elements of the system, but it's embedded in the system itself. And this is hardly a model uh, in this particular context. OK, so where do digital twins come from? Now, the term uh, appears to have first been coined in the early 2000s. It's like all these origin stories. You can, uh, if you can trace it back to Michael Greaves in 2014, uh, you can probably trace it back to John von Neumann in 
1937 or Alan Turing or somebody like that, if you can trace it back to Alan Turing, you can probably trace it back to Leonardo. If you can trace it back to Leonardo, you can trace it back to the Greeks, basically. So, uh, to some extent, all origin stories are like that. But it does appear that this chap, Michael Greaves, um, wrote a paper in the early uh, 2000s about production processes. Uh, and in production engineering, uh, there's a great deal of uh, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing uh, going on in that sense. And he argued that um, uh, the twin was very close to the real thing. He didn't go as far as to say it was the real thing in some sense. And the fact that he's used the word twin, I suppose, plays on this idea of maybe it's not an identical twin, uh, identical twins and non-identical twins and so on in that context. And it opens up this whole notion about um, if we have digital twins, are they identical, are they, are they not identical, um, uh, can we have digital triplets, can we have and so on. Uh, and it, you know, it, in some sense, thinking out of the box like this forces us to think about what the nature of the model is in some context. Now the closest in our world we are to the components of, uh, in, in terms of a city uh, is this idea of the building information model, the idea of the model that actually not only actually designs the building in some sense, um, uh, which can be a computer-aided design in some sense, but also actually controls the functioning of the buildings. Um, and in some senses, buildings are being wired in some way, uh, and the software which is associated with their wiring is very close to this idea of the digital twin in some sense. The twin can exist within the building, etc., but you, the building can still exist without there being a twin, etc. It simply wouldn't be wired in this particular context. Okay, now let me actually um, digress quite dramatically, um, and this is a bit of fun, basically, before we then steer back to talking about examples of digital twins. Okay, and I'm going to look at this notion about the map, basically, um, and how close uh, is the map that we might produce uh, which is a model in some sense, uh, to the real thing itself. Now, um, there's a very uh, famous paper by Benoit Mandelbrot uh, called How Long is the Coast of Britain, uh, written in science in 1967. Uh, and this really is one of the uh, origin stories about the development of fractals, okay, uh, fractional objects in mathematics and in uh, well, a whole range of things, etc. Um, and Mandelbrot introduced the idea of the fractal by saying, how long is the coast of Britain? Now, normally, um, uh, what, you, what you would do uh, to measure the coastline is to take a map. So we take a map of Britain, in a sense, uh, and we, uh, we take a measuring stick, a ruler, uh, in some sense, uh, a scale in that sense, um, and we measure it according to that scale, and basically we get an answer, basically. We get the perimeter, in that sense, how long is the coastline of Britain? Uh, if we do it again with a more detailed scale map, a finer scale map, uh, we might start at a map which is, um, oh, we're in America here, so uh, uh, probably one inch, one inch to one mile kind of works here, basically. Um, one inch to one mile map, uh, and then we move to six inches to the mile. These are classically uh, old-fashioned uh, British uh, measures of uh, imperial measures. Uh, then the six inch to the mile map is much more detailed. Uh, if we take our six inch to the mile ruler uh, and we go around the coastline, uh, we get an answer where, which is different from the original uh, one inch to one mile map, um, and that uh, value is normally greater, etc. As we increase the scale of the map, uh, as we get finer and finer detail in the map, we have more and more things to measure around. Imagine yourself going onto the beach and being given a tape measure, and you're going to walk all around the coastline of Britain, uh, and where do you actually, you've got this problem about what is the coastline at this point, a definitional problem, like what is the boundary of the city. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you might say, well, we're going to measure around every little pebble, every little rock, etc. Uh, and you could even go down to the uh, microscopic scale and measure all of the particles in the sand and things of that sort. And each time, uh, as you increase the fineness of the scale, um, the perimeter would get longer. So the answer to this question is that the length is infinite. The but the real answer, of course, is that it actually depends, and it depends on the scale, basically. So to some extent, uh, the map uh, is immediately uh, a model of the real thing, but we can change the model uh, quite dramatically by changing the scale, etc. 
<coughs> now, in this context, the best story I've ever heard, and the one that's widely close to quoted, is from Lewis Carroll, who was the <coughs> author of the, uh, the famous... Um, well, um, it's hardly a child's fairy tale, but um, Alice in Wonderland, basically, and Alice in Looking Grass. Um, and in his last book, called Sylvia Bruni Concluded, he tells of a conversation uh, between himself and a German gentleman about making a map close to the real thing. So this, in other words, is our digital twin. So let me actually read out the, uh, the thing that uh, in, um, in Lewis Carroll's book so the conversation goes like this, between me, okay, so I'm the first asking the questions, and mine, her, which is MH, in a sense, so I'm just going to read these out to you. Uh, uh, I should say this with a German accent for mine, her, but I'm not very good at the German accent, uh, etc., English accent. So, me. Um, okay, so the conversation goes like this. What a useful thing a pocket map is, I remarked. Now, mine, her, the German gentleman says, that's another thing we've learned from your nation, says Meinherr. Map making, but we've carried it much further than you. What do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? Me. About six inches to the mile. Meinherr. Only six inches, exclaimed Meinherr. We very soon came to six yards to the mile. I can't say it. Uh, then we tried 100 yards to the mile. And then came the grandest idea of all. Actually made a map of the country at the scale of one mile to a mile. Me, have you used it much, I inquired. It's never been spread out yet, said Meinherr. The farmer's objective, they said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you, it, it does nearly as well. So in other words, we've moved our digital twin to the real system, basically, uh, in this particular context. Now, of course, this was written long before any of what I've talked about today was uh, thought about in that sense. But lots of people have actually developed this. That um, uh, Borges um, uh, has a very nice thing, and I'll show you that in a moment. Gregory Bateson, John Robinson, the economist, uh, Baudrillard, um, uh, David Gallant, and so on. Even D.H. Lawrence said in one of his books, uh, the map appears, appears to us to be more real than the land. That was in 1925. And I'd be remiss if I didn't actually say that uh, this example I've just uh, introduced from, um, uh, from Lewis Carroll, basically, was actually quoted by uh, my late colleague, uh, Lionel March, who was Professor of uh, Architecture at UCLA for a number of years, and uh, this was when he was at Cambridge, UK, uh, and in a paper uh, in the 1974 Urban Development Models uh, Symposium, talking about models, basically, then he repeated, <coughs> and I've copied it out here, uh, the, uh, the quote from uh, Lewis Carroll. He also went on to say that uh, uh, there's another essay by Carroll called uh, The Hunting of the Snark, uh, and in it, uh, 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 Carroll says, the map was a perfect and absolute blank. Uh, all models must be selected in that sense. Uh, and in some senses, this notion of the map being the same as the real thing, or the model being the same as the real thing, uh, really has, has excited people and energized people in this field for a long time. Uh, Lewis, uh, George Lewis Borges, in his essay on exactitude in science, he tells the same story of cartographers so obsessed with their art that they decided to produce the most detailed map of their empire that they could make of a scale to one to one. Now, the next generation, he says, enamored of cart uh, less enamored of cartography than those who made the map had little use for it. But Borges concludes by saying, in the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of the map. I don't know whether you've ever seen the movie The English Patient with Ralph Fiennes uh, clutching uh, Herodotus, the histories basically, uh, in the western de desert during the, uh, the Second World War after he's been shot down in this uh, particular plane. But the, the imagery um, of the desert and the tattered ruins of the map to some extent <coughs> are highly characteristic of, um, uh, of, the, of the Borges essay in this particular context. Okay, to conclude my digression, my interlude, uh, I couldn't come from uh, <coughs> uh, to New York without actually uh, showing you this picture of the New Yorker. So this is uh, what New Yorkers think of um, uh, of uh, uh, of the world, basically, uh, viewed from uh, here, Broadway, I presume. Uh, and this, of course, is what the Chinese uh, think of the world. Couldn't come to New York without actually showing you China as well. Um, uh, in that particular context. So these are perceptions. So to some extent, if you like, uh, these are uh, digital twins for the 
if you're a New Yorker or a digital twin in some sense or a map uh, if you're a, 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 a Chinese in that sense. Okay, right, let's actually move on to how, how, we, how we're doing for time, right? How are we doing for time? That's the key thing. We have, we have, uh, 15, 15, 15 minutes or so. Okay, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get on to these examples. Okay, so in some senses, back to this idea of the digital twin, uh, I've made these points before, that uh, there is always some latency between the model in real time and the twin in this particular context, uh, in a way. But what is beginning to happen is that a good deal of hardware is turning into software, that hardware turns into software, uh, and the idea of uh, software being embedded in the building it uh, doesn't mean to say that software becomes hardware in some sense, uh, of hard becoming software in, in this particular context, but software is merging into our environment. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, Martin Dodge, with um, a guy called Rob Kitchen, uh, wrote a book, an MIT press book, called Code Space. And it's all about how software is actually, and it's about five or six years old now, the book, but how software is penetrating everything around us in some sense. And that's really what I mean by... Uh, the notion of the digital twin getting closer and closer uh, to the real thing itself in this particular context. Uh, okay, now there's one last quote that I'd like to make uh, before I move on to my examples. Uh, and this is from another famous book uh, where there are many different models uh, which are talked about in that sense, um, many different models of cities, etc. So there's a book, a book by um, uh, Italo uh, Calvino, uh, 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 called Invisible Cities, and they're conversations between Kubla Khan and Marco Polo. And one of the stories there goes as follows. I used it in a lecture uh, about 12, ago, 12 years ago in Liverpool, uh, and it's reproduced in my Model Cities paper in the Town Planning Review uh, back in uh, 19, uh, 2007, I think. Okay, so, so this is basically what he says. So all Calvino's stories are like this. So Kubla Khan says... And yet, in my mind, I've constructed a model city from which all others can be deduced. Uh, it contains everything corresponding to the norm, since the cities that exist diverge in, in, in varying degrees from the norm. I need only foresee the exceptions to the norm and calculate the most probable combinations. Marco Polo says, in the same conversation, I've also thought of a model city from which I can deduce all others. It's a city made only of exceptions, exclusions, incongruities, and contradictions. If such a city is the most improbable, by reducing the number of abnormal elements, we increase the probability that the, the city really exists. And this is the idea that out there, there are multiple... Uh, cities in some sense, which we can think of as models of cities, and the ultimate models uh, which we would actually apply to cities. So to some extent, they're all kind of, uh, they're all conversations um, and speculations on how we might think of many different models of the same thing, and indeed many different things uh, which are elaborated from the same model. Okay, now, now for my examples. Okay, so now we're we're changing tack yet again, and I'm going to look at three very different uh, conceptions of digital twins. The first example I'm going to look at is a physical representation of the elements of, of, of the define the buildings in the city. So it's buildings in digital representations, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and then BIM, uh, which is building uh, information models uh, in this context. That's a whole uh, series of ideas or sets of ideas which um, are writ large in architecture and building construction at the present time and do to some extent relate, uh, once we scale them up to city scale, uh, to ideas about virtual realities of entire cities. Etc. So this is really the high frequency city. What can we say about that? And I'll show you the example from East London. Second is my uh, London Tube example uh, where, for example, we have digital data pertaining to um, passengers uh, and trains, basically, and the uh, modeling problem or the management problem is linking passenger movements to train movements for a whole range of things that I'll tell you about. And this is really the high-frequency city, but it has long-term implications. Long-term implications meaning that this data that's being collected is actually showing how the system is responding uh, over time, and it's showing 
uh, once we examine this big data, which is very short term, but over very long time periods, um, and thereby hangs a tail, that's not really been done yet for a whole range of political reasons, uh, then you can begin to identify secular changes uh, in the transportation system, how some stations are losing patronage, others are gaining, and so on. And my third model is of the low-frequency city <coughs> simulating long-term change in urban growth. Now, uh, to introduce the idea of the 3D city, this was a paper that we wrote back in uh, uh, 2005 uh, in the journal Architectural Design, uh, and we had a 3D block model of the city, basically, and these are all pictures taken from it, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. So uh, these models really, um, these models existed, whoops, sorry. Uh, these models existed, um, uh, really the first models in fact existed in the early 1980s, but really by the early 2000s they were being uh, developed in bulk. Uh, and if you go to London or New York here, for example, there are countless of these 3D models basically. So this is our model back in... Uh, 90, uh, uh, 2005. It was built in ArcGIS or whatever the Arc Info software was in those days um, in 3D, uh, 3D scene. I'm going to start seeing it built. Uh, and you can actually see that um, uh, most of this is a block model projected up from the blocks. Um, and bits of it are rendered in a bit more detail now the South Bank basically, just to fix ideas. Um, you can see one of the two iconic buildings in a moment. That's Waterloo Station. Uh, which used to be where the USR came out, and we're crossing now to Parliament. So bits of Parliament there are rendered in more detail. And then there's the uh, what's called the uh, Millennium Wheel, basically, uh, which was put up uh, to celebrate the, uh, the year 2000, etc. And, and all the way around. So you see, most of this model is a block model. And the reason why we built it is not so we can render every building. It's a kind of 3D GIS, basically, in that sense. Um, uh, in fact, uh, this actually shows you the, uh, the same thing. Now, if I click on this, let's see if this works, because this was, these were the first block models ever. This was done by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill uh, back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Now, that was almost prior to the, prior to the PC revolution. They were done on uh, VAX computers. So if I click on this, uh, let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, it is. The triumph of Eduroam, basically. So it just logs on my computer to your Eduroam, etc. And I've got, uh, I've got, uh, oops, okay, I've got this model. So okay, I've turned the sound off. Basically, you don't need the sound. There's some music in the background. So this is what uh, uh, this is what when people made movies back in uh, 30, 35 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, the first example, if you go to YouTube and key in uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill uh, and uh, Wireframe or something like this, then you get that. And there are several US cities in that context. So again, this has been um, uh, really uh, developed um, uh, very extensively in the, in the last 20 years. Let me just uh, move on to... Move on to the next one. Now, here is, uh, here is the kind of thing that's going on. Now, one of the actual features, and this is very relevant to digital twins, is the notion that once we have the model, basically, so this is uh, part of East London, then the model can be translated into many other virtual environments. So, for example, that uh, sandbox there uh, has got the model. So this is the, uh, the model of London. It's highly impressionistic uh, because what they're doing with this model is they're adding information into it. You can see lots of different types of visualization, um, but I think a little bit there, uh, if, if we run this a little bit longer, it scans up, and you can see that embedded in this are things like the tube lines and so on. So in other words, all of these data visualizations have some sort of purpose in some sense, 
Uh, and the purpose, of course, is uh, as the captain suggests, to get the planet. So there's lots of augmented reality in that sense. Now, uh, the same group are actually being involved in um, in thinking about wiring buildings, and this is where the digital twin uh, comes into its own. That this sensor, for example, uh, is being put into a building which uh, we have a new campus in UCL, which is at the Olympic Games site in East London, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Park, basically. Uh, and the building is being wired, um, uh, not in terms of its construction, it's being wired after the fact, basically. Uh, and therefore, all of these sensors actually enable one to actually create uh, the building in some sense. So, from the sensors themselves, uh, the building is created. Now, there's nothing very special about this, except, of course, it's the process of actually controlling and designing <coughs> the building, etc. So, there's the real building. Uh, and this is the model that's actually constructed by sensing all of this sort of stuff using these boxes, basically, and a variety of other media in this particular context. So to some extent, this is a digital twin in the sense that it really is very close to the real thing. But it isn't the real thing. Um, and to some extent, the whole notion, it's still a digital model. The whole notion of it being a twin is problematic. So you see from this, we can actually produce a whole range of different uh, measurements, etc., uh, which really pertain to the performance of the building uh, in this particular context. Okay, let me move on to my second example, which again shows how close we can actually get to the real thing. Uh, this is the subway system in, uh, in London. Uh, in London, um, uh, all of public transport is controlled by uh, Transport for London, that's the uh, public agency, uh, and they use a, a smart payment card called the Oyster Card, um, I think basically they copied the Hong Kong uh, MTR Octopus card, basically. Uh, but this has been it's been around for nearly 20 years now. Um, of course, you can pay with uh, uh, you can use a well, not exactly watch basically, but uh, you can use the watch or uh, a credit card on the smartphone, uh, Apple Pay, and so on to actually uh, tap in. About 85% of people travelling on public transport are using. Your Oyster card, which is a charge card where you, you charge it up basically, you put cash on it, etc. And it records your tap in and you tap out. Now, the tube system is particularly convenient to actually study it because it's a closed system. You have to tap in and tap out. The bus system, you only tap in. And the reason for that is to do with the notion of one man buses and the driver actually uh, acting also as surveillance of passengers to some extent. Um, and um, it's not possible to, for the driver to actually uh, look at people getting on and also getting off at the same time. So hence the reason for that. And the data is much less useful because we don't have origins and destinations. But from this tube data, we do. Now, that's the passenger demand data. This thing over here is the supply of trains data. Once you get into the system, you want to know uh, when the train is coming, and of course down here, this is from taken from Trackernet, so this is on the central line, this is Haymel via Newbury Park, uh, and this is to Epping, this is the two, uh, central line, two trains going off, a bit like we've got here, in that sense, telling you how long it's going to take. So this is uh, this is the data that really comes from Trackernet. So tube is Trackernet here, um, and this is an API, and we can collect that data. There's a latency of about three minutes, basically. Uh, in that sense, obviously the tube train drivers have this uh, uh, material in the cab, basically. Now, the key thing, this is basically demand data, uh, passengers, and this here is supply data. What we'd really like to do is to build a model of the process of linking demand to supply. Now, um, uh, You'll appreciate this directly, but in the London tube, like here in New York, uh, there are some very complicated underground passages. That if you, uh, if I go into Tottenham Court Road tube station um, and go down to the central line, uh, because I do it every day, I know exactly which way to go. I know how to take shortcuts, basically. You know these directions that say you don't go down there. There's most of people going down there. I know how to do all of that, basically, etc. If you were to come into Tom Court Road Station for the first time, it might take you five minutes longer to get down to the platform where you want to train. It's not a very complicated station. Some really complicated ones right here. Uh, and in China, some massively complicated ones. Uh, but what we don't have 
is a way of tracking the passenger to get on which particular train. Now that's very important because if you're interested in improving the, the quality of the journey, you really need to know what passenger gets on what train. Uh, because a train that gets disadvantaged that stalls, uh, there might be, it might be a full load of uh, passengers who've been disrupted and sitting in tunnels for sort of 15, 20 minutes, and then suddenly the train within the platform, people get on who've not been disrupted, etc. So at any point in time, disruption is quite complicated. So we need to link uh, tap in and tap out to the trains themselves. And of course, we can't link them because of privacy, and uh, you can't track people in the tube. The bylaw says we can't do this. Uh, London Transport says it's a, a judicial thing. Uh, the cameras, you can't take photographs in the tube, people do, but uh, you're not supposed to. The cameras are all there for security purposes on by London Transport. So, in other words, this notion of connecting up demand to supply, which would be really useful in terms of managing the system, etc., is almost impossible in that sense. Let me show you some, um, uh, some examples in the next few slides. That's actually the, uh, that's not the tube system, that's the, um, that's the, um, Overground railway and network rail and the tube system. The typical tube map is sort of embedded in the middle here. That's the abstract one. Uh, but that's a complicated system, like New York, like Tokyo, and so on. Just as complicated. Uh, don't think that the Tokyo system is any more complicated than London or New York. Uh, in that sense, it's just that the maps are drawn differently. So we're just doing this on the closed system here, which is the tube. Um, uh, this is the kind of data we've got. We, we've got lots of this data from Transport for London. Uh, what uh, John Reed, who uh, worked on this problem, he's a, a professor at King's in the Geoconversation Group now. He basically worked on this when he worked in Castle as an RA. Um, and he puts together the use of the floor maps. We have when people tap in and tap out, what you see is the tube. That little counter at the top there, this is Wednesday midday, Wednesday coming through to uh, the peak. Let's go to Thursday, Thursday morning, 7 o'clock the peak, uh, and then the middle of the day, then the evening peak, and the late evening peak, you can just see at that point, which is sort of entertainment peak. So in this kind of data, uh, we've got all the kind of things that we're interested uh, in terms of actually sensing uh, what they're doing. Now, of course, we, we don't know what person gets onto which train. Uh, we don't know what line they, we, we, they tap in, and we know where they tap out, so we know their origin and destination, but we don't know their route uh, because we can't track it in a sense. And there are lots of different routes uh, that you could take to go from A to B. And so what we use is the shortest route algorithm, the standard Dijkstra algorithm, or some variant of it in that sense. Uh, and we know that that is not, not perfect in some sense. So even this data um, is slightly problematic. Now, there's some pictures of the... Uh, John and the data. There is a YouTube movie actually of, of this, basically. So um, what I'm going to do here is um, I've just clicked on the. Uh, you can see what you're seeing there. You can see this is the, uh, the weekly cycle with the morning and evening peak. Can't really make it out to the top here. Uh, this is the trains data. I'm just going to click on this trains data here. Um, these are the trains. Now this is particularly interesting in terms of big data. Um, uh, because uh, this is simply a day, day's worth of trains data, so it's a different frequency. This is actually a week's worth of passenger data, so I've not been able to, I've not needed to coordinate them. I'm just showing you. Let me just go to the, uh, uh, go to the next slide uh, in that sense. Uh, this is showing you in a bit more detail to show you some of the problems. Now, um, uh, these trains are supposed to be on these lines. Now, look at the purple line up there. That's the uh, fake blue line, I think. And um, some of those trains have fallen off the line. So I said to my RA, uh, Richard, would you put the trains back on the line? <laughs> and he said to me, well, he said, you write and talk about big data. How am I possibly going to put these trains back on the line? There's, there's literally millions and millions of observations. Once the train gets on the off the line through noise, it's noise, the tracker net resetting itself all the time, very old technology, analog technology probably. Um, so it's, 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 it's resetting itself. And I could, he said, put the trains back on the lines. I'd have to pick, I'd have to pick every, one, uh, every one of these... Um, every one of these things that's off the line and physically move it back to the line. Uh, and he says, you can't do that with big data. So in other words, here's a classic example of 
looks like good data. It's got noise in it. We know what the noise is due to, uh, but very difficult to correct it. Now, when we look at the passenger data, the passenger data is very interesting uh, because they gave me um, uh, a day's worth of uh, what's called data for the tube in November 2010. And I found that in the data they give me, just for the tube station, they didn't give me the, uh, uh, the routing data, uh, I found that um, uh, in total, uh, 5.2 people tapped out and 6.4 million people tapped in. So there's a, the, I'm sorry, it's 5.4, 6.2. 5.4 tapped in and 6.2 tapped out. There's a difference of about 800,000 passengers. And where did that difference come from? Well, dead easy. Basically, the, the barriers are left open at night by the porters. Uh, some of the suburban stations you have to self-validate on the thing. Um, you're supposed to self-validate your card, even if a barrier is open. You go down the platform and the, you'll see a, um, a thing that's validated there. Uh, um, if you're a season ticket holder, or if you are a freedom card holder, I'm a freedom card holder. That means I'm over 60, surprise, surprise, over 60, and um, uh, that means you get what's called a free bus pass in Britain. Every local authority issues people over 60 with a free travel, travel pass, basically. Now, we only have one subway system in Britain, well, two, there's one in Newcastle, but uh, it's only small. Uh, and um, uh, so basically, sort of, living in London, you get this fantastic uh, freedom pass where it's free up anywhere on the system. So that's, that's no different. So in other words, I don't have to tap in. If the barriers are open, you know, I don't need to tap. Of course, data is being missed if I don't, basically. So these are some of the pitfalls of big data. Now, we do really like to, um, uh, that's, these are the kind of things we get from it. And I couldn't resist showing you a picture of big data in 1939. This is actually taken from the Getty archive. Why well, Getty's got it, I don't know. But it's London transport workers, um, ladies, etc. very sexist, I think. Uh, but back, it is 1939, it's, um, uh, this is uh, six months before the war in Europe broke out, when, uh, uh, when uh, Britain and France had gone declared war on Germany, basically, 1939. So they're analysing, they're counting these tickets to look at origins and destinations. So in some senses, there's nothing new under the sun. These problems are still the same as they've always been. It's just that we now uh, are working with them digitally. Right. Now, my last example, okay? My last example, I'm going to actually uh, to go through this very quickly because I appreciate I've been going on for a bit. Um, we're building a land use transportation model. Uh, the land use, you don't need to worry about these things except we drive it by predicting employment and trips, which is the journey to work. Uh, and we have a link back to the journey, to, uh, the demand for commerce and retailing. Uh, so this is a kind of employment population model. It's a kind of very standard land use transportation model built for a cross section. And one of the things we've been doing is actually uh, making these models very visual because we want to communicate them to people who are interested in looking at planning alternatives. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is London and the outer metropolitan area. Um, to fix ideas, it looks like a big spot, but basically Greater London is in the middle here. That's about, um, this was 2001 data, but it's about 15 million people and uh, about 8 million live in what's called the Greater London Authority area, uh, which is the inner area. If you go to London and you go to Heathrow, uh, then you are on the very edge of the Greater London Authority. I think the next, uh, uh, the next example show it? No, I'm sorry, it doesn't show it, but, uh, and I'll, I'll whip through these quickly. Uh, but basically, um, essentially, the Greater London Authority, where the tube data was that I was talking about, was in this bit here, basically. So this is the more dense bit. But this is basically Greater London. I should say this is Reading over here. Mm -hmm. uh, all the London airports are contained in this, but Oxford and Cambridge, which arguably are really part of the London <coughs> region, are not in there, but they're just on the edge of this region. Okay, now we're in, what we're interested in, this is a major problem uh, in building any models, is where do we draw the boundary, etc. So what you're actually seeing here are predictions from the model. It's very visual in that sense, but we're very interested in drawing the boundary, basically, because if we draw the boundary in the wrong place, then a lot of the movement in and out is not captured. So to some extent, this boundary is drawn in such a way that it minimizes the outflow 
you can see that even, even here, for example, at Reading, you've got a big town, you know, three, four hundred thousand people on the edge of the region. Although if you go west of Reading, um, it drops off very quickly, basically, the uh, population density in that context. So, so visualization is all important. We wanted to make this model visual uh, in this context. And what we wanted to do was to scale it up to um, England, Wales, and Scotland. Now, that's a picture of England and Wales at the same sort of scale. So this is the region that you're seeing here. Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool. Distances are very short, very small in Britain. It's about uh, 180 miles from Manchester and Liverpool to London, about 90 miles to Birmingham. Uh, this is the coal field with Leeds and Sheffield, all these places here. That's Newcastle at the top, and that's South Wales, Cardiff. So in this box, basically, I mean, this is essentially the North States of New York region, basically. It's sort of, anyway, um, we're really talking about uh, um, about 40 to 50 million, well, about 40 million people in this area here. So it's urban Britain, basically. That's it. Okay, now we're building a model uh, which is not only visual, it's web-based, uh, and anybody can run it anywhere. It's for England, Wales, and Scotland, uh, and it's a ba basically a set of web services that you can log on to this model and test any scenario. The reason why we're interested in building it for Great Britain is because many of the things that are happening in our country at the present time, uh, such as our flotation with high-speed train, um, Britain's railway building era ended at the end of the 19th century, uh, and now we're beginning to have to renew it. High-speed trains and so on, new tracks. High-speed one is the Channel Tunnel link. High-speed two is the proposed uh, uh, London-Manchester railway. Um, and high-speed three is the one that will go up towards Newcastle and Scotland. Uh, these are all impacts that have, are much bigger than any particular town. So we really need to model the whole nation to look at some of these impacts. Globalization, too, is such that uh, we really need to do that. It's web-based. It's on the web. So we're building a an online tool, basically, so that any planner or policy analyst anywhere in Great Britain, basically, uh, can actually test their own scenarios. The scenarios are very simple, they're very sketch, put in so many jobs, put in so much population and so on. Uh, and that's the actual block diagram. Uh, we use a, um, a lot of, uh, 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 well, there's quite a lot of uh, web-based services being used for that. Uh, our programmer, Richard, um, well, he's sort of, Gerasa, basically. Um, he basically um, uh, thinks of this as a set of web-based services, sort of GIS inside, and of course he thinks of it too as being any model, not just a, uh, a model like this, but also say a 3D model. He thinks of the same kind of structure as being for any model in that sense. So to some extent, it's a kind of abstract architecture for the model. Okay, now this is quant. This is what you get if you like log on, uh, and this is the version for. Uh, England and Wales. Uh, we've added Scotland. The reason why we added Scotland late uh, was because Scotland has a different uh, Registrar General for the census and the data wasn't quite available in that sense. You have a series of pull down menus that enable you to click on. So we've clicked on there and that's observed population. Uh, it'll freshen up. Let me actually uh, show you working uh, in that sense. So, uh, okay, it's come straight away. It's not bad. Um, so explore quant. Uh, basically, um, so if I click on uh, population, etc. So now these are all, I mean, Renfro, you'd know all about these. These are map box technologies or something. It's all Greek to me, but um, anyway, let me, this is population density. So we're just exploring the data here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is employment density. And uh, you can actually see it's not employment density, it's employment, basically. And um, basically, uh, this is the centre of London, this is the square mile. Uh, these are called MSOAs, middle aged super rapid areas. Uh, and you can see there's a great concentration of jobs here. Uh, Two million jobs in this area here. Uh, Four million in the whole of the Greater London Authority area. That's the smaller area, basically. Uh, so highly... Uh, uh, monocentric city like New York, like, uh, no, not quite like Tokyo, but uh, certainly like New York uh, in this particular context. You can query it, so if I go to here and click on that, then it says that's the city of London, so on one, and there are uh, back in the year 
2011, basically, it's 10 years out of date now, there were 356,000 uh, workers uh, recorded in the census at that particular point. Okay, so anyway, this is giving you an idea of, uh, uh, of what quant does. Now, it only really comes into its own, basically, when we look at scenarios. So here's a case where uh, what we've done is we've added a bunch of jobs. This is uh, Merseyside, um, uh, Liverpool here, Manchester over there. And um, we've added some jobs. If you look at this thing, we put in 40,000 jobs. And what the model does is, as you'd expect with any of these models, it enables you to run it in real time. You know, see that the model works straight away. It has to work straight away. That's why it's so compute intensive. There's so much computational uh, uh, thinking behind how, how the thing works. Um, and uh, what we're doing is looking at the impact of these things. Uh, this is where population uh, locates, basically. So put these jobs in there, you would expect this kind of pattern to take place. A more complicated scenario where we change um, uh, transport and so on can also be done. So that's the extension to Scotland, uh, etc. Employment density population counts. Uh, we have a version working for Cambridge at a slightly different uh, level, uh, at a, <coughs> a finer scale, and that's the one that is actually being used with the Cambridge Peterborough Combined Authority and uh, Ying Jin and Li Wan, who are the academics at Cambridge who developed their model, uh, are using Quant to do that. Okay, now, now I've been going on far too long, and uh, 1426, my goodness. Uh, um, okay, uh, the concept of the, is the concept of digital twin useful? Well, um, you, uh, to some extent it has to be, in some sense. Uh, I leave you to judge, basically, but it, it, it's like many things, both good and bad. It forces us to think about how cities are changing, how models are proliferating, how do we deal with many models of the same problem. That's the classic thing, many models of the same problem. How do we deal with that, basically? How do we somehow put them together? In a sense? That's an enormous question mark, and that's what we're beginning to get. Forces to think about what smart cities are about, and that's part of the de debate about how cities are being transformed by new technologies, in this sense, and it forces to think about what a model is all about, uh, in some sense, and how we can link many models together, um, and how uh, we can have many models and many different conceptions of the same thing at the same time. So these are the, the sort of long-term kind of reflections, if you like, that uh, really deal with that. Okay, so thank you very much, and if you want to read um, a little bit about digital twins, and my paper, The Map is Not the Territory, these are not papers, these are editorials in the journal Environment and Planning B, Urban Analytics and City Science. Environment and Planning B is the journal that uh, my friend Lionel March set up, uh, who I mentioned earlier on, uh, many years ago, and I became editor in the mid-1980s, uh, etc. So have a look at those editorials. They're online, um, Sage, EPB, we'll get it in Google, uh, and you can actually download the editorials because they're open access. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we have some time for questions if people want to stick around. I know I certainly have some questions. Um, but uh, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll wait. Okay. Um, I think it's very interesting this notion of digital twins and how you specifically said that ask the question whether or not digital twins are identical. Yeah. And I think that if we look at a lot of the, the, the big data that's being produced today, I think because it's not intentionally created, there's a theoretical kind of ident identicalness between yes. the, the data and the reality. Yeah. But yeah. because of its unintentionality, it we generally find, and your kind of example shows that they're far different from yeah. um, the reality. Right, right. right. And so, and, and I don't think this is just a, a different, you know, I don't think it's just a matter of yeah. time. I think there's something yeah. that's like inherently glitchy about the unintentional data that it creates. And how do you propose to kind of like square the glitching? Yeah. Um, Okay, that's a very interesting point, because um, what you're really saying is that uh, the data that's generated uh, by these sensors is, to some extent, uh, does not reflect 
what we might be interested in with respect to the system. Um, so it doesn't match necessarily what we consider to be the most important features of the system. Whereas traditionally, if we were to mount, for example, a household interview survey, so transport's a good example because in the past people have uh, got transportation data through uh, quite uh, um, expensive uh, samples of households. 10% um, samples of households were done quite routinely in the 1950s and 60s. And um, that data was very expensive. It was quite good. And there's obviously lots of issues to do with ambiguity of questions, all that sort of thing. But the data was quite pertinent. What you could get from that data was where people started the trip and where they ended. Now, with the uh, big data from the Oyster Card data set, we can't do that. We only know where they get onto the tube and where they get off. We don't know what else they do. So Transport for London, who have many different data sets, I mean, they're the agency, public agency responsible for everything going on there. Uh, they have many different data sets. They do their own um, longitudinal data sets and, and so on. They've not been able to use this data yet because they find it very difficult to stitch it into other data. In other words, to actually coordinate it with other data, to, to merge it with other data. In other words, this famous quote of adding value to a data set by putting two things together, they're not able to do in that particular case. And this is to some extent the same with, I've got a, a student doing, um, uh, looking at, uh, well, you know, mining tweets basically from the Twitter API and plotting them, uh, looking at them spatially. Lots of people have done this. Um, and he's particularly interested in trying to infer um, characteristics of the person who tweets uh, with respect to what is in and around that particular person. Uh, so typically, um, if, 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 if somebody's tweeting about, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Tottenham Hotspur have just lost at, uh, at home against Manchester United or something, uh, and he's near the ground, you know, the Tottenham Hotspur ground, um, then basically um, he, 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 he is trying to associate what's in the message with what's local to the particular message, to the person sending the message, to try and derive, if you like, um, intensity data. Uh, land use data would be a bit strong, but trying to derive that. Now, that's very problematic because there are lots of data sets that could, in principle, be linked, at least they're giving you the same sort of thing, but in practice, it's simply impossible, basically. Um, deriving social networks, for example, from... Uh, social media data seems to me to be extremely difficult. I mean, when you tweet, you know, retweeting, that's hardly a network. It's, it's a kind of network thing. But um, so there's a whole range of issues pertaining to the nature of the data, uh, which is coming out as big data, great volumes of it, uh, that are, are problematic in terms of what we want to do. So I would agree with you entirely. That's a very, um, I'm not particularly aware of Many people have written about it, but it needs to be thought about a lot, you know. But then isn't it kind of, um, isn't it kind of problematic to suggest this analogy, isn't, uh, to suggest that kind of, we can have this one-to-one -one mapping of the map? Because I am not yeah, quite yeah, sure yeah, yeah. that you can ever yeah. get close to that one-to-one yeah. one map. Well, the, that's right. Now, of course... Don't go away from this talk thinking that Mike Batty has advocated, you know, the whole world be, be full of digital twins, which would be the same as the real thing. In fact, far from it. I, I would uh, concur, I, I agree more with you, that in some senses, the reason why one is thinking about it is that the nature of models is, are changing. The, the, the data that we have for models and the models themselves and the fact that um, our cities are now full of uh, different things, different messaging and so on, all of those things are changing the nature of the problem and they're changing the nature of the model. Um, uh, the, in other words, I mean, there's, there's plenty of evidence of that in traditional areas. So, for example, uh, the notion that the city works um, according to the urban economics of William Alonso and Von Thun and, and all these people, that's no longer the case, clearly. I mean, um, when you look at mortgage markets and rental markets and globalization and so on, clearly 
you can't go any, any distance at all to explain the housing market without looking at those factors. They weren't part of von Thun and anybody like that. So in other words, the, system, the models are changing anyway in that sense. So the models are bound to change, and they're changing because of uh, people doing different things and so on. So the digital twin idea is to put the focus back on models. Now, I agree with you. I don't, it's, a, it's a contradiction in terms to assume that the digital twin will ever be the same as the real system. Um, I, the example I gave of the building, software entering the building, is not the same, right, etc. Okay, you can talk about embedding a digital twin in the system which is, uh, which is trying to uh, uh, simulate in some sense, but it's still different in and of itself. Because at the end of the day, they're models. <coughs> models are abstractions, and in a way, we can't predict the future. Um, the future is unknown to us in some sense. Uh, so we can never have a model which is predictable in any sense for a real a real system, really, because the system is has too many degrees of freedom. We just don't know what's going to happen, right? Basically, so there's there's all issues like that. So they're all tied up in the same sorts of things, and I think we need. I mean, I'd I'd like to really read something by people about about these issues. Basically, there's not that much out there, but I think it, I think people it's growing a bit. I think. So um, that's really. Uh very helpful to think about models are changing. And so one of the functions of models is obviously um, predicted, right? And, and then the baseline matters. So in your discussion of low frequency versus high frequency, the implication is also shorter time span versus yeah. longer and shorter time interval versus longer. Yeah. So in that case, the high frequency, does it fundamentally change the reliability? Yeah. Uh, or have you observed? that it changes the reliability of you know, one of the functions of the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, um, uh, you're asking the question, can we, we have plenty of predictions of uh, models in the low frequency city, transportation models particularly, which almost universally have, have been demonstrated to be wrong in some sense. Now, that does not mean that they're bad. Uh, wrong does not be, is not bad because they never, you, you know, we're not magicians, we can't predict the future in that sense. So it depends how they're used. But the, the, in terms of the, lo, the, 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 the low frequency city, a lot of the predictions we've made over modest periods of time, uh, years and so on, um, have been wrong and incorrect. Um, in some senses, I think one question that spins off from what you said is. In the high frequency city, are the models that we have likely to produce better results? Now, I know the results will be different because the people involved in using those models are doing different things from in the low frequency city. But at the end of the day, can we um, build a model of uh, movement on the London tube system, for example, um, which might predict what happens um, in certain disruptions, a model very close to the real thing, so the data is being generated. We can't predict a disruption, but we can, once we know there's a disruption, predict the consequences, possibly. Now, I don't think anybody, as far as I'm aware, um, actually people will have looked at this, but nobody has quite phrased it in those terms, I think. Um, and it's part of this notion about if we predict over very short intervals, are we going to get better predictions than over long <laughs> intervals? It's part of that general question. And that's quite problematic because um, the, the conventional wisdom was, I think, until uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, that, yes, yeah, short-term predictions are going to be better than long-term predictions because changes, bigger changes happen in the long term and sh smaller changes in the short term. But in actual fact, um, a lot of things have, you know, proved otherwise. I mean, hurricanes, for example, you know, Hurricane Sandy and all this sort of business, and uh, a whole range of things in that sense, the sort of, you know, black swan effect, you know, the idea that everything, all swans are white, until you discover a black one. That's a pretty radical thing. I mean, only when Australia was discovered did people ever, think, ever see there were black swans, you know, before that, you know, all swans are white, all swans are white. It's the inductive fallacy, basically. Well, Taleb wrote this uh, great book about it, right? The Black Swan. So, in other words, 
it's a tricky one. I don't know the answer to the question. It's well worth it's well worth thinking about, though. I think there's some big questions that come out of all of this to do with predictability and prediction, uh, which we've not been um, we've not because we we sort of have to predict in planning, or we have to try and second guess the future in some sense. We've not been very good at thinking about prediction, but no, but nobody else has either in some sense. So, so I think that's a very important focus relative to the concerns that we've had this afternoon, such as talking about big data, you know, sort of uh, different types of models and so on. changing in that context, that they're getting shorter. Uh, certainly in the professional institutional context of planning in Britain, for example, which I don't know best, um, the timescales are getting shorter. Manifestly, um, 50 years ago, uh, a whole variety of plans were produced for the longer term, and that's no longer the case. So to some extent, you could say strategic planning has sort of formed up the agenda in some sense. Um, uh, and that's actually uh, that's actually um, exacerbated to some extent by the development of this smart cities movement, in the sense that, uh, that, that a lot of people have been attracted to the smart cities movement who don't really have a kind of um, reflective view of cities, particularly. So then, um, you know, city planning is all about you know smart lampposts and all that sort of thing. You know. um, and uh, where Cisco or IBM can make a lot of money, this sort of thing, past the transit systems in, in, in so on. Um, uh, so in some senses, that's actually changed the agenda and pushed it a little bit towards the short term. It so happens, I think, that the people responsible for these short term things are very different from the people responsible for long term things. So, so it's not all bad news, it's not all shifting. So planners still have traditionally the same concerns, I think, although our ability to actually demonstrate a better future uh, over a longer term is more problematic, I think, in that sense. So you're right that these timescales are shifting. And um, uh, uh, when you add to that other timescales about big problems, I mean, one is aging, for example, um, and the impact, particularly in uh, well, probably in China, but also in, in the West, um, uh, aging societies and how that has an impact on cities. And, and we are talking there about, you know, low frequency. We're talking about longer timescales, although um, uh, some of these things are quite urgent in terms of uh, changing demand for facilities and so on. And then you're talking about climate change, right? All of these things have actually taken on a sense of urgency in terms of their temporal frame. Uh, which they didn't have 50 years ago. That I was just reading, uh, just reading on my phone the BBC website saying that Boris Johnson, he's not exactly a climate denier or anything, but uh, he said he didn't get it. He didn't understand why the world was getting hotter. He accepted it because people had told him, right? But uh, there's a big fuss over one of his MPs who's been kicked off some climate panel or something recently. 
Anyway, um, what, I'm getting, what I'm saying here is that the time scale thing is quite, climate change is quite problematic, the time scale thing. Um, in the sense that uh, this, uh, we did this project, uh, the modeling project, um, on looking at the impact of sea level rise in London and the southeast. And there was a big floodplain in the London region. Um, and if the North Sea were to rise by one metre, a lot of stuff would be flooded. So that, that area where you see how east is at the Olympic Games site would all be flooded. As long as nothing was put in place, of course, to stop the flooding. Um, but since, since then, over 10, 15 years ago, we did this project. Um, people are talking about the North Sea rising by about one and a half metres now. I mean, so it's quite problematic. Uh, these the, these issues have become more urgent, so the time scales are changing because of that. And again, I think to summarise, all of these this whole business about the time scales thing, very very important. Again, it's something I think that it'd be nice to see some people write about that in a reflective way in terms of planning. You know. Oh yeah, with that, thank you so much again. For your time. Okay. Well done. Okay.